Today, as part of our week-long Building a Better Bay Area focus on education, with the school calendar about to begin, we will talk with the number one education guy in the state. Now, a little background here. About two weeks ago, Governor Newsom announced school reopening guidelines. The big headline was schools should do distance learning if their county is on the watch list. But there was an asterisk. So if you're an elementary school, you can apply for a waiver to open up for in-person learning, even if your county is on the COVID watch list. Well, last night, the state finally spelled out exactly how that waiver application process works. So joining us now to talk more about that and other matters uh, and what all this means for the Bay Area is State School Superintendent Tony Thurmond. So good to have you with us again. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I mean, our timing could not be better because, uh, you know, the state just issued the guidelines for that waiver process last night. Uh, literally, we are all just diving into the details now. And before we get into which schools should or should not apply for a waiver based on that, uh, what's the idea behind the waiver? Why give an exception to elementary schools? You know, the Department of Public Health has put out this guidance, and I think the notion is, is that you could create small um, you know, centers of students on campus and that that really provides support uh, for parents who have to go to work and just recognizing that students overall, they do better when they have in-person instruction. Now, clearly our schools are struggling with space demand, so it's hard to maintain physical distance. But if you can accommodate safely that you can have some students on campus in small numbers, that does create an important option uh, for our students and for our families. So I believe that's probably what's driving um, that's this new um, this new guidance. We're, we're sorting through it like everyone else. We want to make sure we understand it and see how we can be supportive to schools and parents as they learn more details about it. All right. So tell us about the key points under these guidelines. And as you express, um, this was drafted by the Department of Public Health. And you, too, are now just digesting what this all means. But which schools, as you understand, could or could not apply for a waiver based on the COVID numbers in their county and other criteria? You know, almost any school district could apply for the waiver. And I think it builds off of, you know, sort of some of the science that has been reported now that younger children uh, tend to not uh, carry, um, you know, COVID. And uh, I, I think that's still not a settled science. I think it's important um, that we keep an eye on those uh, data as it's becoming available. But the idea is, is that there could be ways for there to be small numbers of students on campus. And this is important for younger students who can't be sitting at a computer all day, every day. Um, and for students with disabilities who need to have in-person contact mm -hmm. um, with with their staff. This is a hybrid model that really most school districts were thinking about anyway before we saw the really rapid surge in cases that has us at the point now where more than 96% of our schools are planning to open in distance learning. So this is really mm. harkening back to something that many of our schools want, including San Francisco Unified. I know that they've been thinking about this kind of hybrid model where they might use community centers to have some small numbers of students on campus or at least in in-person instruction and so we'll see how this plays out in the next few days and our office will, will be among those putting out some updates and sharing information with schools to help them understand and interpret the new guidance yeah the the guidance is interesting in that it said uh you shouldn't even apply if you're in a county where the cases are, I think, 200 cases per 100,000 people. That's double the threshold to get you on the state watch list, which is only 100 cases per 100,000 people. Now, I think most Bay Area counties are just over the threshold, like between 100 and 120 cases per 100,000 people. So that does mean if they want to, if they want to, those elementary schools could apply for the waiver to open in person to their counties. Doesn't mean the county has to approve. Um, but I'm wondering if you have a personal opinion on that. Just because you could, does that mean you should? I think the decision, uh, the question about how to answer should, really at the end of the day, should really depend on you know looking at the, the amount of cases in an individual county and having a conversation with those county health officers. I want to commend our county health officers. They have been invaluable in the manner in which they've linked up with educational leaders and parent groups to really think this through carefully mm -hmm. has been so helpful. There's no other way to really do this. The California Department of Public Health has put out, I think, broad 
guidelines to think about. They're overworked and just doing so much nonstop. At the end of the day, where the rubber hits the road is at the local level. And I'm grateful for our county health officers who are able to really lean in with superintendents and school boards and to really think about, is this safe or is it not? What I appreciate about this state guidance is it gives a metric to think about when things are not safe, including what they put out just a few weeks ago. If you've been on the, if you haven't been off of the monitoring list for 14 days, that's a real signal that you need to think about. Is it really safe to open? In many cases, it's not. And distance learning, while it's complicated, is one of our best options. And so I still think that we need to put safety first in all of our considerations and make that the top priority and how we make decisions about when in-person instruction will happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, you mentioned the partnership between the different stakeholders. We're talking about parents, uh, teachers, students, the community. Um, these guidelines, and I poured over them because I am a parent myself as well as a journalist, but they say consult with teachers, unions, and parents. What does consult really mean? Uh, what qualifies as consultation? Like, do you need the full support, for example, of your particular teacher's union to, to say, let's go ahead and apply for this waiver? Or can a district just unilaterally say, yeah, we're, we're going to do it. We've consulted as in we checked in with you, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, do you know what the definition is? I, I can tell you what I've been told as I, we've asked some of the same questions. Again, this is the health area where the health departments in the state have written this guidance. Our office has focused more on guidance that has to do with how do you strengthen distance learning. But we've asked the question because we get the question from school districts. Yeah. And so, As I understand it, the language that says that consulting means that um, I think it's encouraging school districts to consult with all stakeholders, with teacher and classified unions, uh, with all their employees, with parent groups and students. But at the end of the day, it does not say required approval. That means that districts can make plans um, to move forward, even if after consulting with employee groups, there is not agreement. Now, there's a reality here, and the reality is that oftentimes employee groups uh, negotiate through bargaining agreements conditions related to when they work in the calendar. And so some of these things, um, even what the State Department of Health has written, it does not, um, it does not take precedent over any agreements that local educator groups have. And so that means that even when there's disagreement, there's still lots of conversation taking place between school district officials um, and, and their staff. At the end of the day, the bottom line has got to be what's best for students. I really want to emphasize that, even though people are talking about language, um, I want to make sure that everyone's thinking about what's in the best interest of students first and foremost. And of course, there are educators who care for them, but that's the bottom line. We got to figure out how to keep everyone safe at this time. Yeah, and, and you did mention that, you know, you've talked to San Francisco, and we did as well. I don't think they're planning to apply for waivers, uh, even if they could. And I think Oakland Unified told us the same thing. So my, you know, and looking at who's saying possibly, like Santa Clara County, they told us they got over 80 inquiries from schools that may want to apply. Contra Costa County said they got inquiries from private schools. So I'm trying to figure out if there's an incentive more so for the private schools to get these waivers and want to do in person. What is your thought? on that, the difference between the public and private schools? It's certainly something I'll look into. I have to be honest, I've not had much contact with the private schools. Um, you know, with the thousand uh, public school districts across the state, we've been really busy just figuring out how to get them ready for distance learning. We're about to make some announcements about, um, you know, partners that we have in the tech sector who are ready to make device computing devices available uh, to our students. We've got a million students in this state who need a computing device. That's where we've been leaning in, is how do we get our students ready for distance learning? How do we make sure that our, our teachers get more training for distance learning? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that we do more family engagement so that families don't get left behind if they don't have all the tools? And so we'll look into the question with the private schools. I'm just not familiar because um, I've been so focused on sure. our public schools. We want all kids to be safe, and, and we'll look into it to see if there's anything that we can learn from the uh, private schools about how they're approaching um, this this opening question. Yes, your, your realm is quite big and big enough already. Um, I do appreciate that. I'm glad you brought up the digital divide issue because we're going to take a short break on the air. And when we come back, we do want to tackle how you're getting uh, kids ready, no matter their socioeconomic background, for distance learning. And I want to talk to you more also about the ethnic studies curriculum that you've been diving into as well. So take a short break, but we can continue this conversation on our live streams right now. In commercial break. 
uh, and we are here today with Superintendent of Public Instruction, Public Education, Tony Thurman. Uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that you are always, to the extent possible, making yourself available to ABC7 News viewers and our Facebook followers. Um, I, I do think you're a wealth of information every time, so I appreciate it. Um, I brought up the private school thing because I do wonder if you think the waiver process may perhaps widen the gap of social inequality in terms of what, you know, kids are getting in our state. Uh, already, you know, I think people had very different experiences in the spring and some of it based on their zip code. Um, how do you plan to address that? You know, I didn't write the waiver guidelines, but here's my understanding about the motivation behind those who did. They're actually trying to figure out ways to close the gap from an equity standpoint. I think that part of their motivation is to recognize that there are some students who won't do well in distance learning and didn't do well before. Mm. And they're trying to create opportunities where students can have in-class instruction um, in ways that support better learning for them, uh, access to their instructors. Maybe they don't have computing devices. So I get that. I think that's an important rationale. My thing is, is make sure we put safety first, no matter what. We can always open in distance learning. And if we need to move back, um, from it to get into in-class instruction. We can always do that when it's safer to do so. Okay. Uh, hey, did you see there was a picture today uh, on social of a Georgia school that reopened? I think it was a high school, and it was a crowded, very crowded hallway, and the kids weren't wearing masks. I just wanted to ask you, with the rules that we have here in California and mask wearing and all that, that could not happen, right? Uh, that's correct. Um, you know, our, our office has put out guidance that says everyone should wear a face covering, uh, both students and staff. And the California Department of Public Health has since put out guidance that also says that everyone from, you know, certain grades up should be wearing a face covering as a student and that all staff should be wearing a face covering. The governor's okay. office. Is all right. With our Thank office you. Uh, we're coming back on air. So I'm going to ask you to hold off there. Thank you. And we're back with State School Superintendent Tony Thurman. Uh, Superintendent Thurman, thanks for joining us. I don't know if you saw over the weekend um, a really heart-wrenching letter written by an Arizona superintendent who lost one of his teachers. She shared a summer classroom with two other teachers, no students in the classroom at all. And he said even though COVID is raging in the state of Arizona, uh, he is facing having to choose between bringing kids back physically in two weeks or missing out on 5% of the state funding. Um, that doesn't happen here. That's not the case here in California, right? Funding is not tied at all to in-person or distance learning? Correct. We've actually gone the other way where we've guaranteed funding for all of our schools, even if they open in distance learning. And quite frankly, I think those who threatened it to slash funding are really being irresponsible and reckless. Uh, and I, look, I just have to call it what it is. We, you know, we all have to open safely. And I'm coming to you today from one of the schools that we run for students who are deaf, a fabulous school uh, in Riverside, uh, a fabulous school that we also have in Fremont. And we're opening our schools in distance learning. And we're going to monitor to make sure that things are safe before we revolve back to in-person instruction. And I just think that it's better to be safe. Making threats to take away funding if a school doesn't open, irregard mm -hmm. regardless of health conditions, to me is really dangerous. And I think we need to go in a different direction. Promote safety first, even though we know it's important to have in-person instruction. Yeah, and, and weren't there, haven't there been also threats of taking away funding for lunches, free lunches for kids? There have, and again, we've gone the other way. Right now, there is a proposal in Washington, D.C. that needs to be renewed that makes it easy for families to get lunches uh, during this time. In California, during distance learning, we know that our students and families got meals at 5,000 locations across the site, uh, the, the state. The need is incredible. And so I've been in contact with the U.S. Department of Agriculture through letters, uh, reaching out to Congress to say, please renew uh, these programs that give our families maximum flexibility. This is not a time when Californians need less. This is a time when we need more. Mm -hmm. We need the federal government to support our local businesses, our local economies, and our local schools. And food insecurity is a real issue. we got to make sure our kids can get a meal and do so safely.
Well, yeah, and also child care is an issue, though, and I know as you balance uh, advice and guidance for the school districts, um, you know, if parents can send their kids to school, some cannot work. So given that distance learning is going to be the way we start in most schools here in California, um, what is being done to support the parents who have uh, child care needs because they have to go to work and can't sit at home as their child learns from their computer? You know, even during this pandemic, most of many of our child care centers have remained open. Okay. And the guidance that's being written through the Department of Public Health and the Department of Social Services, aided by our team at the Department of Education, much of it does uh, envision uh, child care centers remaining open um, and making sure that they have lots of personal protective equipment to keep people safe. I'm happy to say that through the governor's office and the Office of Emergency Services, We've sent personal protective equipment to more than 10,000 schools in the state. I'm talking about face coverings, face shields, hand sanitizer, uh, touchless thermometers. Our child care centers have set up protocols that say, hey, parents, take the temperature of your children at, at home. If you see any symptoms, keep them at home. And then temperatures get checked again at the child care center. Our child care centers have done a great job of using the whole campus, including the outdoor space, to broaden the footprint of the campus so that there's more uh, ways to accommodate physical distancing. And so again, I wanna just tip my hat to our child care centers so we know parents need these to work. And I think that's why you're seeing the push from the governor's office and others to create these kind of waivers when school districts can open and have small pods of students on campus because they recognize that parents do need to get back to work and we're trying to balance that, but we gotta make sure that safety remains paramount. All right. Well. If we are talking about distance learning, as is the reality for most schools now, what are the standards? Uh, I'm talking about uniform state standards in terms of how districts approach it, because in the spring, you had such different experiences where some kids, you know, logged on and checked in and that's it, and then did packets, whereas other kids who did distance learning report, hey, I had daily engagement, you know, with my teachers and in small group discussions. It just doesn't seem like we want there to be that much variance in the level of engagement. You know, I, I, you're absolutely right. We know that, first of all, students need to be able to see their teachers and staff. And so to the degree that there's distance learning and remote learning and online learning, you know, there needs to be some direct contact. It can't all be through a platform that students go to. And, and so we're really working with our school districts to think about the balance of how much live instruction that there needs to be um, for our students. And we recognize that there are multiple ways for students to be supported. But, you know, our students look forward to seeing their teachers. They look forward to seeing their one-on-one -on -one aid if they're a student with disabilities uh, who is supported in that way. So we're working hard with our school districts and many of our school districts are providing training to their educators on how to maximize best uh, distance learning. Let's face it, when we went into distance learning, it was the first time for most of Californians. And guess what? We did what we needed to do to keep everybody safe, but there were some bumps along the way. And now we need to make sure that we've learned from that and that we move forward with the best practices in distance learning. That's one of the things that our office is leaning in on. We're working mm -hmm. with teachers, school districts to make sure that we are studying and acting on the best practices in distance learning. Mm -hmm. I want to bring back uh, the issue of closing the digital divide. Uh, I would like to know at this point, with two weeks to go before most schools start, uh, are you satisfied that almost all California kids have access to uh, internet at home and have laptops, Chromebooks, and what is your role in assisting and making sure that happens? Kristen, we're racing against the clock to help the more than million students who are without a computing device and probably 400,000 students who don't have access to the internet. It has been a difficult process, but I think we are seeing, we've seen some things that are really helpful. Internet companies have made uh, internet available sometimes for free and in many cases, low cost internet all across the state. We've insisted on it and now we have that. If anyone needs it, they can get it without giving a social security number or, or any other you know, financial information. What I'm really excited about is tomorrow we're announcing some new information about how we get computing devices uh, discounted to our school districts to get them to our students. It is amazing, some companies have stepped up. Even in a time when there's limited supply, we're gonna be announcing some companies that have basically prioritized our students and they're prepared to make available up to a million devices, which is the same number of students who we know need it. This is incredible. Some of these are the computing devices that are already enabled for the internet so that students only have to carry one device, not a computer and a hotspot. But the bottom line is that these companies have prioritized our students they're putting them in a position uh, where they can get computing devices right away and the internet 
As I mentioned, we'll be making some big announcements tomorrow. We're holding a meeting with 1,000 school districts to help them see how they can make these purchases. And the state has provided money to school districts to, to purchase mm -hmm. computers. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow is going to be an important day. To any school district looking for help on computing devices, we hope you'll contact us at the Department of Education so we can connect you to these computer device companies. Well, Superintendent Thurman, I'd try to squeeze those company names out of you right now, but then that would rob us of our headlines for tomorrow. So uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll take a short break on the air and continue uh, our conversation on live stream. So join us there. In break. All right, Superintendent Thurman, we, are you okay with five more minutes with us? You good with that? I'll speak with you. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Um, I do want to ask you, bringing back that Arizona superintendent's um, heartbreaking letter, you know, in that situation where the teacher caught COVID and died, even though they were so careful, she shared that one classroom with two other teachers, um, no kids there. You know, today, San Jose Unified Teachers, 1,600 of them learned that they would have to go back to their campuses and instruct from their empty classrooms. Some are supportive, others uh, have fears and are com not comfortable with that. What would you say to those teachers? I think we have to be seriously focused on you know what is safe and what is not safe. And I think when we've seen examples of educators who've been harmed, we have to pay attention to that. We should not rush into any circumstance. We should be looking at um, what's the rationale for requiring people to be on campus if we're opening and distance learning. If there are ways to safely carry out one's work through distance learning, is there a rationale for why someone would have to be on campus? I just think we have to take safety as our top precaution for our students and their educators because everyone is at risk here. And we, and we need to think about who our educators and students come in contact to. They can also put others at risk. So safety first. And I think we have to be cautious about who's on campus and when. Mm -hmm. um, Tony, what is your thought on standardized testing this year? Do them or hold off? Uh, you know, I think that uh, the data that we have right now suggests that we may want to also uh, continue um, to, to, to hold off on standardized testing uh, this year. I think we need to wait to see uh, when the conditions improve such that students can come back to school. And if they can come back to school for in-person instruction in a meaningful way, then perhaps there's an opportunity for standardized testing. But what we've oh, seen since on. last Sorry, March. Five, four, hold on. <laughs> hang on. All right, we are back with State School Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Um, for our last segment here, I want to talk about, given the distance learning that most schools will adopt as a model to start the school year, any efforts to address special needs kids on individualized education programs or IEPs? There's no question that, you know, um, special education wasn't, you know, designed to be provided through distance learning. And so we know that we've got to counter that by doing good things that we can do online learning and remote learning. And I just want to commend our teachers who leaned in here and have done great work. The mistake that any district can make is to say we're not going to do anything for our students with special needs. I think that's wrong. Uh, we know now that we can provide great things like IEPs can be done uh, through uh, remote. Um, we know that teachers have been very creative and staying in touch with families, even by the phone. And that we know that when students see their one-to-one -one aides on a Zoom, that makes a great deal of difference uh, for them. We, we, because there's not a lot of uh, research on all the best practices in distance learning, we actually put out a call for ideas and innovation from many of our teachers and, and ask them, what worked for you in distance learning? What didn't work? And I can tell you that already, we've heard from about 200 teachers who've sent in great ideas. And so we know that we can do great things for all of our students, including students with disabilities. We're leaning in. Our office has already provided more than 60 webinars, including how to, to deliver uh, services to students in special education and English learners. We're gonna make sure our students get the best that we can, keep them safe, address their social emotional learning needs like counselors to help them and make sure we focus on what we call continuity of learning good quality learning even if it's delivered through a computer between teacher and student we want to make sure that they get everything that they deserve and that they need well we certainly hope that it does get delivered because our state was ranked 37th uh, by u.s world and news report last year for education even before covid i'm sure that is something that you've been working on shoring up uh, for the past year and i just wonder yeah. if you think you know this is going to set us further back well, I'm certain that the 37th and out of 50 ranking has to do with how we fund, um, you know, students. 
um, per pupil. And, and sadly, California has lagged in this area because of how our tax structures are work, uh, work and, and how we get revenue for our schools. That was my top priority coming into this office um, in 2019 to increase our, our, our per pupil spending. There's a November ballot measure that would generate billions uh, for our students. It's called Schools and Communities First. And I'm encouraging voters to pass it because that will give us billions for our K-12 system and for many of our local cities that need additional revenue. And so um, money's not everything, but having it helps to make sure that we pay teachers well and we provide lots of training to support educators and that our students have the resources that they need. We know that there can be learning gaps from, you know, exacerbated by the pandemic, but we know when we lean in and we make sure the students have devices, we do good family engagement and great training for our great educators. We know that we can offset those learning gaps. That's where we're focused right now as we approach the next few weeks of school. We know that there's a huge challenge facing us, but we're leaning all the way in. We can do more together, and we know that we can do a great deal for our 6 million students in the state of California. All right, Tony, another priority of yours in the past year, developing the ethnic studies curriculum for K through 12. Uh, this is something, of course, being done on the college level as well in California. But uh, you just had this new draft come out, and I know you are going to dive into it and tackle it, and there's going to be all this review. But tell us, what are the key components? I know there's been a big change, so go ahead and explain that to us. Really excited to talk about ethnic studies. We spent the last four weeks doing what I call a mini series, a virtual learning series, so that high school students can learn about ethnic studies. We did this really in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd so that our students would be supported. Our students were saying, we want to see positive representations of ourselves that we don't always see in our history books. Ethnic studies gives us that opportunity. And so uh, we had a great conversation with great leaders like Dolores Huerta and you know Karen Korematsu, who's the daughter of a civil rights leader in our state, and people who teach African American studies and Native American studies, um, Asian American studies, and and, and support uh, for so many in what we do in ethnic studies. Uh, we've released a new draft that's intended to be a guide for our thousand school districts to create their own ethnic studies curriculum. It's going to get discussed at a special commission on August the 13th and then ultimately go to the State Board of Education to be voted on uh, by March of, of next year. And so we've just begun the conversation, but we're grateful for the rich conversation that we've had uh, around uh, you know, ethnic studies, mm -hmm. like I said, for African-American students, Latino students, Asian-American students. Um, pardon me, but on that note, we'll have to take this conversation over on our live streams, take a short break on the air. I feel like the rude student always cutting you off. Um, good, Superintendent good. Thurman, is this going to be an elective or a graduation requirement? There is legislation pending uh, in the legislature as we speak that would make ethnic studies a graduation requirement. There is a bill by Assemblymember Medina, who represents Riverside, that if passed uh, would require uh, it as a graduation requirement in high school. It's a great bill, um, and its direction is important. Uh, and that bill will be voted on in, um, by the end of August, which is when the legislative session will come to a close. We hope that the governor will support it. There's also legislation moving to be signed by the governor. It's already passed both houses that would create an ethnic studies graduation requirement um, in our CSU system. That's by Assemblymember Weber out of San Diego. And so that bill has already passed both houses. Uh, and we'll go to the governor's desk for signature. And we also encourage that that bill be adopted. Uh, we think this is a great time in our nation at a time when we need healing from all the issues around race and racism. Um, this is an opportunity for us to address bias and to really teach about the great contributions made by African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans in California. All right. Well, I think it would be certainly terrific to read uh, materials written directly by those different voices that have contributed to the rich history of California, uh, not just summarized by certain editors, but really, you know, the primary sources. That would be a great goal, right? It is indeed. And, you know, it's important for the self-esteem of all of our students to see positive you know, contributions made by their ancestors. And this is an important time in our nation's history. I believe that we're all leaning in together for social justice and racial justice. And ethnic studies is a very important component towards creating the, the well-being that we need for all people in our state. All right, Superintendent Tony Thurman, thank you for coming on in this conversation. And by the way, please thank your staff for us as well for always generously giving us a lot of your time. Take care. See you next thank time. You. Thank you. You well. Thank you.
All right, that's going to do it for now. Thank you so much for joining us for today's interactive show, Getting Answers. Hopefully you got some insight into the elementary school waiver process and how this semester may look for your school. Our Education Week continues tomorrow. We'll be here every weekday at 3 on air and on live stream answering your questions. So I will see you back here tomorrow. World News Tonight is next. Thank you, Facebook friends. Great questions today. Great conversation.